have nicknames for your spouse? Raise your hand if that's true for you. All right, yeah, right? We all have nicknames, various uh, nicknames we have for ourselves. Some of them you could say out loud. Some of them are probably just between the two of you, right? Um, I get that. I understand that. One of the names that I can say out loud that I have for Heather that I call her is love of my life. And the, yeah, thank you. Thanks for that. Yes. <laughs> She doesn't respond that way, but. <laughs> uh, and, and actually, that's what this uh, sermon series is entitled, Love of My Life. And what we're doing is we're looking at Ephesians chapter 5, which you could turn there and we'll eventually get there. And it talks about and shows us what it takes to develop growing, healthy, thriving relationships. Part of developing those thriving relationships, I would suggest to you, is that you would take me up on whatever challenge or, or, or homework, if you will, that I might give to you each week. Last week, I encouraged you to ask your spouse if you're married or if you're not married to somebody else, ask them the question, how can I serve you? I hope you took me up on that. I, I hope uh, you did that. And um, if you didn't, I would encourage you. You're like, well, I'm going to wait a week so it doesn't look like it's because the pastor said. Okay, well, then this is the week you can now do that. I, I just know this. If you do that, that is going to help you grow and develop your relationships with others. Today, what I want to do is I want to kick off by talking about a marriage that you have probably never heard of. It's the marriage of Martin Luther to Catherine von Bora. Now, that name Martin Luther, you might go, oh, I've heard that name before. Who was Martin Luther? He was famous for starting the Reformation. What was the Reformation? It was basic, he was basically saying that it's the Bible and not the church's teachings that has the authority in our lives, which is what we believe here. It's the, God's word. That is our authority. It's not some random teachings of some church. Now, one of the uh, teachings of the church that he had issue with was that they taught that all clergy had to be celibate. And he said, listen, that is nowhere in the Bible, of which, of course, I say, praise God, it's not in the Bible. <laughs> and he wrote the book on monastic vows in which he proved that forced celibacy for a priest, that's an invention of man and not from God. And he ended the book by encouraging priests and monks and nuns to throw off their vows of celibacy and get married for the glory of God. Well, 12 nuns at this one particular convent heard about all this, and so they decided to take him up on that offer, but, but the Catholic Church wouldn't allow them to leave that convent. And so... With Luther helping, working with other people, he helped those 12 nuns get smuggled out of that convent in 12 fish barrels. They found husbands for all of the nuns but one, and that was Catherine von Bora. She didn't exactly have the best qualities of someone you would want to marry her. She was uh, Mary, she was brash, she was proud, and history says she was extremely unattractive. I'm just telling you what, I, it's not me saying that's what history says. <laughs> not that that's required. Eventually, she go, went to Luther and she essentially said this. She said, listen, you got me into this whole mess. You need to find me a spouse. If you don't, then you have to marry me. Well, Luther was a 40-year-old virgin. He was the original 40-year-old virgin. <laughs> He was quite content in his singleness. If you were to read any of his readings, you would see why and what his view on marriage was. So he didn't want to marry her. But over time, she wore him down and he eventually said yes. When asked, uh, hey, why did you marry her? Uh, he said this, this is true, this is what he said. Why did you get married to her? He said, to spite the devil. Talk about the least romantic reason to get married in the history of mankind. Even though their marriage didn't exactly start off like a fairy tale, they ended up having one of the most incredible marriages throughout human history. In fact, the reason we know about so much about their marriage is because of all the letters that they wrote to one another. 
And you discover through all of that that, man, they were passionately in love with one another. His favorite names for her, his favorite name actually was Lord Katie. But he had other names for her, like, and I love this one. One of his names for her was Dear Rib, right, from Genesis, right? Isn't that pretty cool? I'm going to start calling Heather that. Oh, my dear rib. <laughs> he called her my empress, my true love, my sweetheart, dear gift of God. Luther called her the greatest earthly gift of grace a man could have. She truly became his confidant, his companion. And what he said more than anything else, she became his best friend. Friendship. It's one of the most underrated, most uh, least talked about elements of marriage. Pastor and author Tim Keller said that people often see marriage as primarily romance spiced with a little friendship. But Keller said marriage is really friendship spiced with a little romance. See, in order for somebody to have a thriving marriage, friendship has to be at the core of it. Sociologist John Gottman, uh, through all of his research, drew this conclusion based on his research. He said, 70% of wives say the determining factor in whether they feel satisfied with the sex, romance, and passion in their marriage is the quality of the couple's friendship. Surprisingly, it was the same percentage for men as well. And so he went on to write, so men and women come from the same planet after all. <laughs> Proverbs chapter 2, verse 17 tells us, it calls uh, your spouse a unique Hebrew word that literally means special confidant, which literally means best friend. In Song of Solomon, the bride wrote of her groom, this is my beloved, this is my friend. That concept of friendship is in part behind what Paul, the Apostle Paul talks about in Ephesians chapter 5. If you haven't turned there yet go, and you have a physical Bible, go to Ephesians chapter 5. If you don't have a physical Bible, you can go on to the YouVersion Bible app. You can follow along there with us. And in Ephesians chapter 5, the Apostle Paul says this. He says, husbands, love your wives just as Christ loved the church and gave himself up for her to make her holy, cleansing her by the washing with water through the word, and to present her to himself as a radiant church without stain or wrinkle or any other blemish, but that she might be holy and blameless. And then he says this, in the same way, husbands ought to love their wives as their own bodies. He who loves his wife loves himself. So Paul here, the apostle, uses the imagery, the analogy of the physical body to talk about love and talk about friendship. And he says to love your spouse just like you love your own body. You are in tune with your own body, right? You take care of your own body. You prioritize it. It's your focus. You want what's best for your own body. So too husbands in this passage are called to love their spouse in the same way. You're to be in tune with her. You're to take care of her. You're to prioritize her. You want what's best for her. You see, that's what love and friendship is about. And so we're asking the question today, how do you develop that type of love her as you love your own body, that care concern? How do you develop that type of love and friendship? And while Paul's context in this passage is talking to, to people who are married, as we talk about friendship, you need to know that the principles we're looking at today can apply to really just about any relationship. So even if you're not married, there's principles in this that are very important for you. How do you develop a great friendship? Well, it starts with having a dedication and a devotion with the other person to a common cause, and that is to help them become more like Christ. See, what did Paul, uh, Paul say? He said, husbands, you are to love them, and you are to make, in verse 26, you're to make them holy. So God wants Heather and I to help each other pursue what matters most, to have a common cause. And what matters most? To pursue Christ. To be holy. To be blameless. 
to prepare the other for glory. And when a couple unifies behind a common cause or goal, especially the common cause of, in the pursuing holiness, that's what's going to end up drawing them closer together than, more than anything else. That's when a friendship grows deeper and deeper than you can possibly imagine even today. Sure, we can all develop friendships with people around a common cause. And we do that all the time, right? You, you, uh, your kids play sports and, and you meet these people and you end up developing a friendship because their kids play sports. You maybe start hanging out together. Uh, also, for example, you might have a common interest like uh, some type of hobby. Uh, I've developed friendships with people that I water ski with, or maybe you, you, know, you go uh, snow skiing, snowboarding, uh, whatever it may be. Maybe a lot of people nowadays, pickleball is a big thing. People have a common interest and a hobby, and so they develop that relationship. And while those shared interests are wonderful, and they contribute to wonderful relationships, when the common cause is a deeper interest, like you know, growing in Christ, being like Jesus, that's when the friendship develops on a far deeper level. Any of you who are in a life group, that, that life group is truly centered on the desire that you would grow in Christ's likeness. If you're in that type of life group, you know what I'm talking about. You know the type of relationships, that you, these deep abiding relationships that you've developed with others. Some of you have been in those relationships for years. Some of you even for decades because you've united around the common cause. You have a friendship today that you couldn't have imagined because it was all centered on growing in Christ. And when I get to heaven, I kind of hope one of the things that Jesus will say to Heather and I, he'll say something like, listen, I saw you together. That together, you, your goal was to seek to be a little more like me, and I saw that. I saw how over the years you lifted each other up, how you sacrificed for each other. I saw how you washed one another's feet, how you would even confront one another. I saw how you loved each other and you con continually pointed them towards me. I saw it. Well done, good and faithful servant. So how do you develop a friendship on the deepest level? It's having a common goal, a common cause, together helping one another to become more like Christ. Are you doing that? Is your relationship together pursuing Christ's likeness? That's what God calls you to. How else do you and I develop a deep friendship with our spouse or perhaps with somebody else? And it's through developing this unwavering dedication and commitment to the other person. In Ephesians chapter 5, verse 25, Paul says, Husbands, love your wives. And then he gives a picture of what that love looks like. Just as Christ loved the church and gave himself up for her. Here's what we know. Jesus was committed to his mission. Right? We know that. He never walked away from his mission. He never bailed out on his mission, which was to, to die on a cross for our sins so that we could be forgiven of our sins, so that we could have a relationship with our heavenly father. Jesus didn't waver in that commitment. So when Paul says, husbands, love your wife just as your own body, he's saying you show that same dedication and commitment that Jesus had to the church and that you show to your own body. That you show, you show, that's how you take care of yourself. And when you do it that way, when you take care of your own body, and just like Jesus took care and was dedicated to the church, he said, show that to her. Show that dedication, that devotion, that commitment. Proverbs 17 says it this way. One of the most famous verses on friendship, and it says, a friend is always loyal. Everybody say loyal. They're always loyal. Another translation says, they love at all times. In other words, a friend has an unwavering devotion and commitment to the other person. When Naomi said to her daughter-in-law, Ruth, that Ruth, you need to go back to your own family and your own people because Ruth's husband had died, Ruth gave that famous response in Ruth chapter one. She said, don't ask me to leave you and turn back. Wherever you go, I will go. Wherever you live, I will live. Your people will be my people and your God will be my God. In other words, I'm devoted and I'm committed to you. That's friendship. 
And a spouse who is a friend, they demonstrate through words and through action. Doesn't matter how difficult the circumstances get. It doesn't matter how uh, the, the arguments you may have. It doesn't matter how angry you get or how upset you get. They make it clear, man, I'm not going anywhere. I'm here to the end. They make it clear the relationship is for life. In other words, they're always loyal. Practically speaking, a deeper, more intimate friendship, that gets developed with your spouse or with somebody else when you make it clear, man, I'm not bailing on you. I'm not going away from you, walking away from you. I'm not going to humiliate you. I'm not going to expose your weaknesses. And when they feel safe in that sense, that's when they start truly opening up. That's when the friendship grows deeper and deeper. Now, of course, I need to say that there's a caveat to this unwavering loyalty. Abuse is never accepted or tolerated. That's a whole different topic on a whole different, deeper conversation. And frankly, when there is abuse, that means that there isn't a true friendship. True friendship. It's commitment. It's an unwavering dedication and devotion to one another, always loyal to the other person, as together you seek to become more like Christ. How else do you develop a great and deep friendship? It's through transparency. It's through transparency. Again, it's Paul's words, love your spouse as your own body. You know what I know about my body? I know everything about it. Wouldn't you say that's true of your body, right? I know every wart I have, every wrinkle I have, every hair that's out of place. I know the bruises, the bumps, the aches, the pains. Nothing's hidden. My eyes don't say, hey, don't look at yourself. You can't see what's going on. What's the point? We're transparent with our physical body. Nothing is hidden to us. Man, in order to have a thriving relationship, we have to open ourselves up to one another, that nothing is hidden to them, that we are transparent, or to use the word that many of us get real nervous about, that we're vulnerable to them. But pastor, man, you don't understand, when I am vulnerable and when I open up in that way, I get taken advantage of. They use it against me. And I understand that. And while there might be some truth to that, it's probably not as true as you think. And here's what I can tell you for sure. The lack of vulnerability, the lack of transparency, that will create a far greater distance and chasm from you than any potential way you perceive that they, have, that they are taking advantage of you when you try to be vulnerable to them. Man, when we close off, that's a guaranteed way to keep a deep chasm between each other. The reality is some of you are a closed book to your spouse. And that's just why you don't have the friendship, the relationship that you could have. You're missing out. You're missing out and you might have reasons. You might have the story that you tell yourself. And I can tell you this, that soundtrack that you're playing over and over in your head, it's keeping you distant from one another. So a simple tip, maybe not so simple, but a tip that you could dip your toe into this world of transparency or for some of you who are there a little bit to maybe dip dip your foot in, your leg in, and your whole body in. Is, is once a, every single day when you get together at the end of the day, maybe you've been working, kids have activities, whatever the case may be, you tell your spouse, you sit together, you tell yourself something that happened that day. You're like, I do that all the time. Okay, you tell them something that happened, but then you tell them how you really feel and how you feel about it. And I know, I know, I know, this is typically, not always the case, but typically more difficult for you dudes, for us dudes to do that, right? To really open up and share our thoughts and share our feelings and be concerned for others. It reminds me of, of a story that uh, comedian Brian Regan said, uh, told a story about his wife. And uh, I'm not going to attempt to tell like a joke here, but 
there's humor in it. Um, and again, I'm not trying to tell the joke, but, but here is the gist. His, his wife asked him when he got home from playing golf, because he had gone out and played golf with his, uh, one of his best friends who had recently broken up with his, with his girlfriend. And so his wife said, uh, Brian, he said, hey, how's Gary? And he said, I don't know. And she said, oh, I thought you guys were playing golf today. And he said, yeah, we did. She says, and you don't know how he's doing? He says, well, it never came up. <laughs> she says, well, is he dating anybody? I don't know, he says. How would I know something like that? And she says, how could you play golf with him for four hours and you don't know if he's dating anyone? He says, I know he has a new putter. <laughs> and she just can't comprehend this. She's like, how is it possible that it didn't come up? And he says, how is it possible that it would come up? Hey, nice putt. You dating anybody? <laughs> Again, I don't know if it does it justice, but you get the gist. But that's kind of how we are, guys, right? And we need to work on it. We need to work on opening up and sharing and caring and sharing how we feel. So every evening, take some time. Talk about your day, but not just talk about it. Talk about how you're feeling about it. Being more open, more transparent, including your feelings as you talk to one another. And again, I know for some of you are like, man, I'm out of here, forget that. But that is one of the keys, transparency, to developing a deeper friendship. Now, for a master's level course in transparency, next, allow your spouse to call out your sin. Yeah, I said it. The reality is this, they already see it. So how about we be humble and open to receiving a gentle rebuke? Because remember, what did we say? We have a common goal, a common cause together to seek to pursue Christ, to be more like Christ. That's our desire. That's our goal. That's where we're headed together. Proverbs chapter 9 says it this way. Don't bother correcting mockers. They'll only hate you. But correct the wise and they will love you. Proverbs 12 says, whoever loves discipline loves knowledge, but whoever hates correction or reproof is stupid. Now, I don't want you to answer this question for the person next to you. I want you to answer this question for you. When it comes to how you respond to correction, are you stupid? I'm just quoting the Bible. <laughs> Meaning you hate correction? Or are you wise? Meaning that you receive correction because you know it's going to make you a better version of you that you want, that you desire, that God desires, that everyone desires. What are you? Are you stupid? Again, quoting the Bible. Or are you wise? There's no better person to correct you than that person you married who loves you most. But I get it. I understand when our spouse, you know, wants to correct us, our usual response is, hey, as you get ready to correct me, hold on, let me go get my list that I have that I'm going to share as well. Don't do that. Don't go there. Great friendships have an openness, a transparency, where you allow one another to speak truth into each other's lives. Let's go back to that analogy of the body that the Apostle Paul talks about. When it comes, comes to taking care of my own body, you know, cleaning it, uh, for example, shaving, for example, I'll tell you this, I don't want anybody else to shave me. Why? Because, man, I, I, I'm afraid. I'm afraid they're going to take that razor and, and slash me up or not be gentle enough. In order for your spouse to let you clean their spiritual body, they have to be absolutely convinced that not only do you have good intentions, but you're not going to go poking around and slashing them with a razor. So be gentle. Be kind. Galatians 6 says it this way, my friends, if someone is caught in any kind of wrongdoing, those of you who are spiritual should set him straight, but you must do it in a gentle way. Say gentle. 
Romans 5, 15. So those of you who have a strong faith must be patient, say patient, with the weaknesses of those whose faith is not so strong. And we want to help each other. Help each other carry our burdens. And so we want to do so gently and with patience. And of course, the absolute best way to set yourself up for success with a, with a correction or an observation or a rebuke is that you spend far more time showering them with praises, noticing the great works in their life, praising them for who they are and what they're about. You spend more time doing that than you do focusing on their weaknesses. 10 to 1, 20 to 1, 30 to 1. Make it your mission to praise your spouse 10 to 20 to 30 times more than you ever would with some type of comment that might be difficult for them to receive. Man, the best thing I can encourage you to do is be an encouragement machine towards your spouse if you're not married to your friends. You need to know this if you're married, and you probably already figured it out pretty quickly. You married a sinner. It shouldn't surprise you when they mess up. So when the other person knows, man, they're not seeing them as a sinner constantly, you're actually seeing them as your best friend. And they, when they know you're the bigger, their biggest fan, when they know that you only want what's best for them, when they actually feel that, that's when it's more likely. They'll be able to take a critique to heart because they actually can feel that you care about them. They know that you actually love them. Why? Because you are constantly showering them with words of affirmation and praise and blessing. And so then they're able on occasion to receive that comment that might be difficult to otherwise receive. Great friendships have an openness to one another. They're transparent with one another. They're vulnerable, even able to give and receive counsel and and give them even correction. So, since friendship is at the core of great relationships, what does that look like? How does that play out for us? If you're single, here's what it means. It means you prioritize friendship in the beginning and throughout the dating process. Friendship is your priority. What Adam needed in the garden was not, you know, just some hot looking girl or somebody who could be a sexual partner. He needed a companion, bone of his bone, flesh of his flesh. Remember, as Tim Keller said, marriage is not romance spiced with friendship. It's friendship spiced with romance. Beauty fades over time. Sexual or romantic appeal can fade over time. Earning potential may not turn out. None of those make for a fulfilling relationship. But friendship, that's what lasts. Friendship is what can grow and grow and develop and develop, and it can get better with time. So prioritize friendship in the dating process. And as we've already said, and as Scripture says, prioritize a person of faith. Dating a non-Christian or marrying a non-Christian, that's just not God's will for you. 2 Corinthians 6 says, do not be unequally bound together with unbelievers. Do not make mismatch alliances with them that's inconsistent with your faith. And just practically speaking to that verse, you're just not going to be able to share on the deepest level, level possible if you're unequally bound with an unbeliever. Because what's the deepest unity? What's the deepest friendship? It's a friendship rooted in Christ where together you're seeking to become more godly, more holy, and blameless. Also, one more thing for those who are single. Beware of the intoxication of physical contact. What am I talking about? There's a lot of reasons that we should keep physical contact before marriage to a minimum. But one that's often overlooked, physical contact just has a way of clouding your judgment. You don't date to be physically close with another person. That's not why you're dating. Why are you dating? 
You're trying to figure out and discern, is this person going to be a lifelong friend and companion to me, the love of my life? You'll have your whole life to be physical. But when physical touch or or even sex is front and center in a dating relationship, I can just tell you, your ability and the, to think and discern if this is the person God has for you, it is greatly diminished. Your wisdom is low. So, prioritize friendship in the dating process. Also, prioritize friendship, as we've already said, in your marriage prioritize it. Whether you're newly married or you've been married a long time, maybe for decades, it's never too late to prioritize your friendship with your spouse. You need to know nothing can replace the centrality of friendship in your marriage. Not hobbies. You can try, but it's not going to replace it. Not hobbies, not career, and not even kids. God did not put a parent and a child in the garden, did he? He put a husband and a wife, Adam and Eve. Kids, they're in addition to an already completed family unit, the husband and wife. Kids are not the center of it. Ephesians chapter 6 tells us this, to raise up our kids. Now, what does that mean? It means we're going to raise them up in the Lord and to know the Lord. And it also means raising them up to get rid of them. Amen. (laughs) And what's left when you get rid of them? What you started with, husband and wife together. And so hopefully and prayerfully, there is that incredible friendship together. You need to understand if you're married, the greatest way that you can show love to your kids is prioritizing your spouse and for them to see that often, that they see that you're friends and that you continually develop that friendship. Final thought, marriage isn't the only relationship we can experience a deep friendship. Um, Remember a couple weeks ago, if you were with us or you're watching online, uh, we learned that marriage is is temporary and that the church is eternal, right? In marriage, scripture says you become one body. What else is called the body in the Bible? It's the church. So I don't want you to miss this. The church, God's people, are those with whom any person, single, married, widowed, divorced, whatever the case may be, any person can experience a deep friendship with someone who's a part of the body of Christ because the church is in fact our eternal family. Romans 12 says, even though we are many individuals, Christ makes us one body and individuals who are connected, connected to each other. The reality is the church is a community of friends. We are a body connected to each other. And I would say this to those of you who are married, it's important that you be sensitive to and aware of your single brothers and sisters in Christ. Be a blessing to them. They need your friendship in their lives, but you need theirs as well. And as we close, it's important to remember that in order to have an amazing friendship with your spouse or even another person, that requires that you first are connected to God because it's out of your friendship with God and your relationship with God that can flow deep abiding relationships with one another. So I ask you, are you connected to the Lord Jesus Christ? Is he the primary relationship in your life? Is he your Lord? Is he your savior? If not, in a moment, I'm gonna give you an opportunity to invite Jesus into your life. Jesus will come into your life. He'll be your Lord and your savior. And you know what he also said? He said, I wanna be, I call you friends. And you can even have friendship with God. And out of our friendship, out of our relationship with God, that's when you can build deep abiding relationships with one another. Do you need Christ Jesus in your life to come into your life, be your Lord, be your Savior, be your friend? I want to give you that opportunity now. Let's pray.